<laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. Good? It's Father's Day, is it not? How many dads do we have out there? A few. And where's the rest of the dads that should be here this morning? <laughs> Sleeping in. Sleeping in, golfing, who knows what. They should be at church because we're going to talk about, again, how really to be legendary dads. And I'm not talking about a legend in your own mind. <laughs> I'm talking about leaving a legacy for your wife and your children and your church family that when they think about you, the first thing that comes to mind is what a mighty man of God. What a man of nobility and character. And I believe that's what we are all striving for. The first Father's Day was celebrated June 19th in the year 1910. Now we know, guys, the next year, the best gift for dads ever was invented. We know what it is, the 1911. <laughs> now isn't it interesting that, you know, Father's Day began in 1910, and the very next year they got the best gift that's ever been given. <laughs> where's, where's Chris Brunn at? Yeah, he just got cleared to carry his 1911 on duty, so he's pretty stoked about that. And I hear he did really well at the ranch. Better than anybody. That's what wow. he said. Yeah, that's <laughs> You believe him, right? Sure. <laughs> it's a legend in his own mind. Okay, some of you are feeling uncomfortable with that up there. We're in Genesis 17. Why don't we turn there? Genesis chapter 17. And this is where Abram's name is changed from Abram to Abraham. And I believe it's extremely appropriate and probably God's providential uh, plan that we would be in this chapter of Father's Day. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. I keep forgetting I need glasses. Chris, you missed it. <laughs> All right. Chris, just for you, we're going back. All right. Uh, Father's Day, the first one was June 19th, 1910. The next year, the best present any man could get was in there. <laughs> right. It is now right. The Colt, 1911. Okay. Genesis 17. <laughs> and I told him that you were the best shot in anybody at the range the other day. No, you said it compensates for poor shooters. Oh, okay. <laughs> Genesis 17, 1. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. I really believe that we all need an encounter with God. And if you haven't encountered God personally in your life, there's nothing more important than that. Abram had many encounters with God. He didn't always trust God. And God told him, and we've been on this verse for two weeks, walk before me, walk in my presence. Everywhere you go, recognize that I am right there with you and be blameless. Be obedient to my word. Listen to my still small voice. Listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life. I've got a plan. I want to guide you. So walk in my spirit. Walk in my light. Abide in Christ. Never let that go. And be blameless. Verse 2. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. I believe that on this Father's Day, it's appropriate that we're in this chapter talking about Abram. Now, what does Abram mean? Who knows? It's up there. It will be up there. Abram means exalted dad or father. Abraham means the father of a multitude or father of multitudes. You ever sing that song? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. 
You know that song, right? I am one of them, so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right. Right. <laughs> I love that. Keep going. Verse 5. And no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. <coughs> Father's Day can be difficult for those that have lost a dad or if you've lost a child it can be extremely difficult but know this we're all part of the family of God and you got a bunch of kids right here and even if you've never had kids aren't you glad that we're a family and all of the little kids in our Sunday school and man we would I know we would lay down our life for those kids we would do whatever it takes. On this Father's Day, we want to give honor to all the dads and future dads. However, honor is not, honor is earned. It's not simply given. Guys, this morning, if you feel like your wife doesn't honor you, doesn't respect you, maybe it's time to begin to strap on the armor of God and begin to live in such a way that honor and respect is not only earned, but it just naturally flows. Are you living your life this morning, guys, in a manner worthy of honor? Would you, when you look in the mirror, consider yourself a noble man, a man of integrity, I believe there's nothing more important than men who claim the name of Christ than to live in such a way that our wives and our children and people at church and our neighbors say there's something different about that man. The way he carries himself, there's a nobility, there's an honor, and it's due. A good dad is being a team player. We uh, all want to be coaches. I've coached Little League stuff. It's a blast. When Cody was a little kid, coaching those kids in basketball and baseball, it was really fun. A lot of time, but it's fun. I know Mike coaches a lot. Being a good dad really means to be a good team player. No man wives wake up in the morning and say, let me figure out how I can irritate my wife today. You know, but don't we always do that to you ladies? <laughs> Do not raise your hand and don't say amen. <laughs> Somehow we tend to irritate our wives. We don't know why. It just comes naturally to us. Somehow we end up men neglecting our children. We don't know why we're busy. We've got things to do. By the time we get home, we're so stressed. We just don't want to decompress. And we need our time. And the next thing we know, our kids are graduating the eighth grade. And we wonder what happened. No man wants to work too much, but inevitably we do. Most of us would work every day of the week if we could. I can tell you this, despite this, a lot of men, they look at their lives and they didn't really turn out the way they planned. Father's Day can be a difficult time. I really believe that if you begin to strap on the armor of God, and that's what we're going to talk about today, and to fight for your families, and to fight for your relationship with Jesus Christ, and when temptation comes, recognize it's a battle, and recognize that if you yield to that temptation, you simply ripped off your armor and joined the enemy's camp. For those of you in the military, that's unheard of. In law enforcement or even uh, fighting fires or whatever job you have, guys, it would be like all of a sudden joining the other team and the other side and fighting against your commander-in-chief, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Many men are getting exactly what they want, but they don't, uh, only to find out that it really doesn't satisfy them. You ever do that? You dream, man, if I could only get this thing, then my life would be good. And you get it, and what happens? 
Everything turns out the same. After a while, it's just a thing again. Materialism won't satisfy you guys. So on Father's Day, what's the greatest gift you could get? For a lot of guys, rest. <laughs> it's like, you know what? We work 24-7. For some reason, our lives in this culture have become so busy. But guys, i got to tell you this. The price that you are paying... Hurting your kids, neglecting your wife, neglecting your families. It's too great a price to pay. We need to run to the Lord. Seven things about guys, really quick. We love adventure most of the time. So in marriage, after a few years, it's no longer an adventure and it's no longer a hunt. You see, prior to marriage, we were hunting for a wife. We really were pursuing that. Once we get married, the adventure is gone, and the hunt is over. So how do you keep your marriage alive? A lot of guys, the next thing, we like to fix stuff. You ever notice that, wives? You come to us, you just want to pour your heart out about this problem that you had that day. And guess what happens? Us guys say, well, let me tell you how to fix it. I used to do that with my wife. Boy, it would turn into the biggest argument, the biggest frustration, because they don't want us to fix that. They just want us to hear and love them. <coughs> We're either logical or emotional, rarely both at the same time. We can't be. We only think with one side of the brain. So we're either logical and, you know, noble and men that are solid rocks of goodness, but the minute we cross that line into emotionalism, you've seen it. We lose our temper. We punch holes in the wall. We get weird. Because the logic is thrown out the window. We can't do both. You can do both. Logically emotional. I, I don't know. I can't comprehend it. <laughs> but you can do both somehow. We all want to be a hero. And we all need admiration. Men, I can tell you this. If you live your life according to the principles of the Word of God, your wives and your children will respect you, will admire you, and you will be a hero in their eyes. Travel back to me. I want to look at the last eight things we've given guys for Father's Day. We're going to do this quick. See if you can remember. Number one, 2005, we talked about providing roots and wings, gave everyone a bullet, it's all shiny, looks powerful, but without a gun, it's worthless, correct? 2006, and by the way, without Christ, you can't do it. You might look shiny, you might have all that and more and look powerful, but you don't have God to actuate what you are. 2006, we gave every man a rock, and I found that unless our lives are built upon the rock, Jesus Christ, we're failing, both as a husband and a dad. Colossians 3.19, I just want to read it again. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger so that they will not lose heart. I believe as we begin to live our lives according to the Word of God, Something different, something changes in us as men, and we begin to walk as ambassadors of a heavenly kingdom. <clears throat> the idea of nobility and leaving a legacy comes with all humility, and you remember what my definition of humility is. It's strength under control. It's not, hey, walk all over me. But it's being strong, yet controlling that strength. 2007, we talked about nail spikes and dads. How wives and children are the aesthetics in the home, and we're the spiky nails that hold it all together. We gave everybody that eight-inch spike. Remember that? I was going to bring mine, but I actually used it. It's in my garage. I hammered it in, and I have a whole bunch of stuff hanging on it. It's amazing how that one little spike could actually hold my weight. I tested it. Isn't that cool? Guys, you're the iron that holds your families together. And men, sometimes we clash. But as iron sharpens iron, Proverbs 27, 17, 
So one man sharpens another. We need that. We need that in our lives. 2008, we went to David, actually Psalm 18, and we talked about the Lord being our rock and fortress. A place that we can run. A stronghold in the day of battle. We gave everybody that member title slate. Chris, is yours on your desk still? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mine's on my desk at home. The rest of you guys, were, where's yours? <laughs> <laughs> and just like that coaster protects the table from the stains that cups can give it, so we protect our families from the stains of the world. It's up to us to guard our children, what they watch, what they read, what they listen to. You ever tell your wife not to watch a TV program? That's a tough one. <laughs> but we should guard that as well. Men, we're the filter with which we protect our families from the things of this world. 2009, we gave everybody a piece of a tool set. With that one little piece, you couldn't do anything, but with all pieces of the tool set, we could build anything. We talked about the need for unity in the body of Christ and that we're all members and function together. Remember this one, 2010? Mm -hmm. Are you pliers or are you a vice grip? And this we talked about with pliers, if you had to hold up a weight, pretty soon your hand would cramp and after a day maybe or maybe even after five hours of trying to squeeze those pliers in your own strength, you would fail. Vice grip, once you clamp it down, it holds. Just like when we give our lives to God, He does that. 2011, we gave everybody solar-powered lights. And we said, unless you're spending time with Jesus Christ in the Word and in prayer, unless you're spending time in the Son, you will not recharge your batteries. You feel weak this morning, you need to start spending more time with Jesus. If you feel stressed out this morning, you need to get into the Word of God and let it wash and cleanse your mind. Because I do know this, when you turn to Him, His strength fills you like a flood. He gives you everything you need. Spending time with Christ is extremely important. 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that a great promise? Walking in the light. Didn't God tell Abram that in Genesis 17, 1? Walk before me. Abide in me, in my love. Bask in the light of my Son. Because that will give you strength. You wonder why you lose your temper, lack patience, or filled with anxiety? I can tell you this, you're not spending time with Jesus. Because the minute you begin to do that, He begins to empower you and strengthen you. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. What does it say? Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. By the way, all the guys that uh, help with the move, thank you so much. Tim has been working his tail off, man, moving stuff. Jake, way to go. Those boxes of books, you should have seen Jake manhandling. I mean, they, we had a, over a thousand books to move, and I told him, use small boxes. Well, for some reason, we had big boxes. So, you know, they're two-man lift, and Jake's like picking two at a time and <laughs> just tossing them like they're nothing. I, it's amazing. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31, the first part of that, putting it in context. Do you not know, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired. And young men, vigorous young men, stumble badly. Yet those who wait upon the Lord, hey, it's them that are going to gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. And this morning, guys, I know, in this life we are so bombarded with busyness, we need the strength of the Lord. 
If you're trying to do it in your own strength, I can assure you this, you're using something to numb yourself. But the Word of God can take you out of that stupor. We need to press on with the Lord. 2012, we talked about being adjustable to meet the need of the moment. What did we give everybody last year? Press a wrench. Press a wrench, right? Oh, it's up there. <laughs> oh, I hate when I give the answer. We get into a lot of nutty situations, right guys? And we need a crescent wrench to be flexible to meet the need of the moment. We compared three tools. One is a what? What's the first one? You see, that's inflexible. It meets one size of nut and that's it. And for all the situations in your life, it won't work. A pair of pliers, you flex on your own position, and those you can actually squeeze people to death. You can hurt them, even though you might be able to touch a bunch of different nuts. <laughs> Some of them, you might crack them. Ah, but that crescent wrench is adjustable. And it perfectly fits the need for each situation without being too firm, or without being too light. That's exactly what we need to be. We need to adjust to fit all the nuts in our lives. Remember that? Not our wives and kids, but others. The tool used to be called a spanner way back in the day. Any, anyone remember when these were called spanners? Okay, that's back when they were first invented. And then one guy who started making a crescent, they, they started being known as a crescent wrench. And soon after that, now, they're literally called an adjustable wrench. Guys, we need to be adjustable to fit the need of the moment. Always. Acts 7, 51. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, we're going to talk about that next week. Because that's exactly where we're at in Genesis 17, where God gives the, the covenant of circumcision. And ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. We need to be adjustable, guys. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Think about it. When's the last time the words parted your lips, and as soon as they went out, you knew, Oh, shoot, why did I just say that? The worst part is when we say it to our wives. Because we'll pay for it. <laughs> Guys, we need to think before we speak. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Speak words for the need of the moment to edify and to build up. Don't have bitterness and wrath in your hearts, verse 31 and anger and clamor. Put it away from you. Be kind to one another, men. Tender-hearted to your wives and your children. Forgiving each other, just as God and Christ also has forgiven you. It's so important that we do that. And that brings us to today. Are you meeting the needs of your family? What does the Bible say about a man who doesn't meet his family's needs? He's worse than an unbeliever. Unbeliever is pretty bad. Have you ever thought about that? And this guy's worse than an unbeliever because men, there's a natural instinct that God has given us to protect our wives and our children at all costs. I don't believe there's a man in here that wouldn't in a heartbeat lay down his wife for his wife and his kids. In a second, <laughs> jump in front of them to take the bullet. So the man that doesn't provide for his family and is not meeting his family's needs is worse than an unbeliever. They have gone against every characteristic that God has given us and built in us to protect our wives. And yet, what does the enemy do? For some reason, he gets that wedge in there where men sometimes become embittered against their wives. Sometimes they get angry with their kids. We need the armor of God 
on because it is a spiritual battle. Men, if you're finding yourself not fully in love with your wife this morning, believe me, you're in the midst of spiritual battle. If you're finding yourself so irritated with your kids that you don't even want to nurture them anymore, you're in the midst of spiritual battle. Guys, kids, if you find yourself embittered against your parents, I can tell you this, you're in the midst of spiritual battle because the enemy is coming to divide families, to divide churches, to wreak havoc in your life. We must always provide for and protect our family. Spiritual battle always begins at home. Oh, you'll carry it to the office. You'll carry it to church. You'll carry it everywhere you go. But isn't it interesting that the enemy always begins to attack at home? We need the six pieces of armor on today. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. All four of these imperatives are military terms. There's over 20 passages in Scripture that equate the church as an army at war. Ephesians 6.10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. It's really time to stand strong, man. To fight the good fight. Ephesians 6, 12 through 20 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers, and the forces of darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. How many pieces are in the armor? Six. Some people say seven, but prayer isn't part of the armor. That's the actuator to the armor. You see, if you have the armor without prayer, it's pretty much useless. But Paul sums up that list of the armor of God with this prayer. That's how you use your tools. James 4, 7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Every time you're tempted, guys, you need to resist. Take those thoughts captive and run to the Lord. The word resist is to stand firm against. Again, it's a military term. To hold your ground. Last week we talked about the schemes of the enemy. We got it from Genesis 17.1. God says, walk in my presence everywhere you go and be blameless. So what does the enemy try to get you to do? Be isolated from God. He will isolate you from God and your spouse and your children, and He will try to get you fully alone in this life. When that happens, the fruit of the Spirit begins to leave. The joy, the peace that you used to have, the strength, the faithfulness, the gentleness, all of that begins to go. He'll try to get you to compromise, and that removes your armor. And He'll definitely always try to deceive you. He kills, steals, and destroys. Luke eleven twenty one. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. Let me ask you this, man. Are you guarding your house? If you don't have the armor of God on, there's no way you're guarding your house. You can't. The enemy's in. And he's wreaking havoc in your family. But armored up, he can guard his house. Uh-oh. Struggles. Did it go away? Right there. But note this. Verse 11, 22. But when someone stronger than he attacks him, overpowers him, he takes away from him what? All his armor. What's the enemy trying to do? Take your armor, guys, and gals. We all strap on the armor. He's trying to remove each piece of the armor and then steal everything else that you have. Has the enemy robbed you of the Holy Spirit today? Or the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Do you have your armor strapped on? 
any breach in your armor will mean complete failure for you as a man of God, husband, or dad. The six pieces of the armor are very interesting. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17 talks about them. You can turn there, but it's going to be up there too on a cool video I found about the armor I got up there. The belt of truth. Let's talk about that really quick. What is it? Don't answer that. Because most people will say what? The Word of God, right? No, that comes later. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So what's the belt of truth? Who's our enemy? Do you have the full armor of God on? This year we're giving every dad this cool little screwdriver set that I had Tim use to take something down off the wall and I said, how is it? And he goes, what did you say? <laughs> Wonderful. There are six pieces, uh, six different bits on this screwdriver. I wanted to remind you of the armor of God. Guess what the handle is? If these are the armor, what's the handle? How does he sum up the thing? Prayer. This bit is good, but I can assure you, in my own strength, trying to screw a screw with this bit, I can't do it. But the minute I strap on that piece of armor and empower it with prayer, man, I can screw the tightest screw in and it will hold. Because without prayer, guys, you're simply trying to screw stuff with a bit in your fingers. There's no way you can do it. The belt of truth. There it is. I love that video. Oh, it's so fun. It's not the Word of God. It's men who operate in honesty and integrity. It's always telling the truth. Let me ask you this. You ever promised your kids something and not done it, guys? You don't have the belt of truth on. You ever promised your wife something and didn't do it? You don't have the belt of truth. What about the breastplate of righteousness? We know what that means. Righteousness is faith and love. Do you have complete faith in God? Do you love Him more than anything else? Do you have faith in your wife? Because righteousness is loving your wife. What about your feet shod with the gospel of the perspiration of peach? Did I say perspiration? <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you bring peace or strife to your home? In the workplace, do you bring peace and the good news of Jesus Christ or do you bring strife? If you have a root of bitterness, your feet aren't shod with the boots of righteousness. The shield of faith, we know what it is. It's complete trust in Jesus Christ. He will see you through any problem, any circumstance. It's focused on Him, and the flames of the enemy cannot penetrate it. The helmet of salvation, it's knowing that you're saved, and it's guarding your thoughts, always. Taking every thought captive to what? Obedience to Christ. That's what the helmet of salvation is. It is the source of of deliverance. The sword of the Spirit is what? Word. The Word of God. Guys, if you're not reading the Bible, you're not sharpening your sword, there's no way you're going to be able to fight. This is our weapon. This is how also we wash our lives with the reading of the Word of God. We need to be armored up. Always. Everywhere we go, we must never take our armor off. I found this on uh, YouTube. <laughs> it's kind of fun. All right. That's, you know, I had to get a little TV in there for the guys. <laughs> so the six pieces of armor, all of those, and this I want you to put in your car. You don't have to. You can put it wherever you want. To remind you of the six pieces of armor, there's six pieces, and the prayer is the actuator. Plus, there's a hidden compartment 
So you can hide stuff from cops. I mean, <laughs> 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 and uh, I, I just put a little piece of paper in there to remind you guys our men's ministry logo, awesome. and then the armory logo. That's our church office. <laughs> so uh, you could put stuff, matches in there, you know, whatever. I don't know, other drill bits or screwdriver bits or whatever. But the kids are going to pass these out. Ross is counting everybody to make sure we have enough. Oh, we have enough. All the guys are going to give them. Men, it's so imperative that we have all six pieces of the armor on to be good Christian men, to be successful in life, to be good husbands, and to be good dads. It's the only way we're going to protect our families. At the end of that discussion on the armor, Paul talked about prayer, and that's the actuator. That's the handle. And he said this, in light of all of this, do what with prayer? Loose paraphrase, always pray. For everything, in all circumstance. Isaiah 40, 31, guys. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They're going to mount up with wings as eagles. They're going to be armored up to fight for their marriage, to fight for their kids, to fight for their own Christian walk. And they're going to see God do great things for His glory. Amen? I just want to end with this verse. The kids are going to get ready to come in to pass out all the gifts. Are they ready, Russ? Not yet, but are they getting ready? Tell them, tell them five minutes. Five minutes. Philippians 4.4 4. Rejoice in the Lord when things are going good. Rejoice in the Lord when your wife's nice to you. Rejoice in the Lord when your kids are being very obedient and submitting to your authority. Rejoice in the Lord when you get a raise. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let me ask you, how are you doing with that, guys? Does your family see you rejoicing in the Lord in the midst of any situation? If they do, they're going to rise up and they're going to say, my dad, he's a man of God. We all fail. Don't get me wrong. Every one of us in this room. There's times I'm having a great day and the littlest thing, I just can't fix it for some reason. Like the other day, our uh, 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 garbage disposal stopped working. So I got you know a crescent wrench, or not a, an Allen wrench, to turn it at the bottom. And I worked on this thing, I was sweating for like 40 minutes, you know, cleaning and uh, all this, reaching my hand down there. And uh, couldn't get it fixed. I was so irritated. And then Cheryl came in. You know, it's broken. I'm, yeah, I've been working on it for an hour. Well, what did you do? I've been working on it for an hour. Well, let's do it again. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, oh boy. Anyway, luckily one of our students is a plumber. And so he came over and uh, helped, helped us for free. But I was so irritated. I was not rejoicing in the Lord when I, the, my first thought was exactly what I said last week. Lord, your garbage disposal is broken. you got to fix it. Remember that? We talked about water heaters or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I took possession of that and I became irritated. I failed. Rejoice in the Lord always, but I, I truly attempt to do that. And to display that to my wife and to Cody and to anybody I'm with. Be gentle. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Again, gentleness doesn't mean walk all over me. It's like humility and meekness. It's strength under control. You ever hear the term gentle giant? It's a man that could snap your neck like that, but he's really gentle because he's meek and humble, strength under control. Be anxious for nothing.
but in everything by prayer, the actuator. That's how you turn it. That's how you go. That's how you work. Without it, you're in your own strength. You can't spin anything. You can't screw in a nut or bolt or screw or whatever it is. But with this, you can do it. And supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then, ah, this is it. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts. What, what guards our hearts? Breastplate of righteousness. Faith plus love. Complete faith in God and prayer is going to be a guard for you. Will guard your hearts and your minds, the helmet of salvation in Jesus Christ. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, and that's your wife, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence or anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be a mighty man of God, armored up, to do great exploits for the kingdom of God. I really wanted to give you guys the thing hanging in my office, the sword there in the back, but it was too expensive. <laughs> so we decided on this. <laughs> I know you're bummed. A sword would have been much better. <laughs> Okay, they can come on in, boss. Stay ready. This is my favorite part of Mother's Day and Father's Day. The kids coming in to pass out the gifts. <laughs> Just watching them do it is so fun. Then let's protect our families and our church family. I mean, we all are part of the body of Christ, the family of God. And so every one of us, when you have a need, you got a church around you, those small yet mighty, We'll rally around to help him. And here comes my favorite part of the whole thing. Let's lay a legacy of faith for our children. 